Speak uh, started a little over a year ago. And it was uh, myself and Danny Boyce, I'm the CEO, and Danny's the CTO. And uh, we came up with the concept for Speak for a modern way to do conference calling. And what we came up with something uh, you might look at is kind of cute. Um, you join a conference call with a phone number, and then you have a conference table, and uh, these cartoon monkeys show up around the conference table. And we're like, wow, this is awesome. And we showed it to people, and everybody liked it. And I think most people would look at that as like, you know, John, that's, that's kind of cute. But Danny and I looked at this and we said, you know what, we're going to revolutionize communications. We're going to change the way people talk uh, for business. So, and we left our, our jobs and we went full time on this venture. Um, we're both entrepreneurs, um, but it's been a little while for both of us. And I've never started a company in DC. So I literally knew nobody in the startup community a year ago. And I set out, and it's very daunting when you're going out like this. Um, and uh, I realized that DC is actually a very welcoming uh, place for entrepreneurs and startups. We have literally benefited from thousands of people and, th and organizations who've given us thousands of favors, often with little expected in return. And that's amazing. And the, the, God, the honest truth is that many of the people here in this room who have helped us, most of you have helped us in some way, in some shape, in some form, you, you really operate on a sense of passion and not necessarily on a sense of uh, a profit. And there's something exciting about that. There's something exciting about what's going on here. There's a sense of momentum. We're building something great. We're building a hub for startups and communities, and we really need to continue to push this forward and, and do great things here. We need more speaks, we need more AOLs, more living socials, more at this, more blackboards. We need more of these companies, and we can do this together. And this event is a thank you to everybody in this room, everybody who has helped us in the last year um, be successful, and I, I say that cautiously because our story is yet to be told, but I consider this last year a success. I'm proud of what we've done, I'm proud of the team that we built, and I'm proud of the product that we put to market, and I'm, I'm happy our customers are using it and they're happy with it. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, move on and, th and thank our team who have worked tirelessly to build Speak, um, they've, <laughs> they've given up pay, they have, uh, they've operated on a sense of passion and faith that we're going to build something great. Um, I'd like to thank the families of our team, um, in particular <laughs> my wife um, and my kids who have supported us and sacrificed and helped me kind of fulfill this vision and passion. So. Um, this is really just a big thank you um, to everybody here, uh, and uh, we really, really appreciate it. We couldn't thank everybody, um, so we decided to throw a big party. Um, let me quickly mention our uh, sponsors, another example of getting support. Um, we have Deloitte, Cooley, um, the DC Small Business, Conrez. Um, we have Washingtonian here, BizNow, lots of great sponsors. Dell. And of course, I haven't <laughs> forgot you. Dell, which has sponsored this VIP event. Um, we use Dell's servers in our infrastructure, we use their, their computers, and Dell, uh, as a company, has been a great supporter for Speak. So we're really appreciative uh, that have come out and uh, supported us here, so thank you. Thank you so much. So I just want to reiterate that same point about that passion, right? The, the passion of entrepreneurs and what you guys have done in here in D.C. is incredible, especially with the launch of 1776. I can't wait to come. Can't wait to come back next year and see what the, what has changed in this community. Um, but I had the pleasure of actually meeting these guys at South by Southwest, and we all know what happened with Speak at South by Southwest. You want to you want to show them anything? No, you don't. Are you good? You don't want to show them anything? OK, no, 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 don't show, don't show. Don't show. Don't show. Okay. No. So, uh, you know, 
it, so, so most people forget this, but uh, I come from a little startup called Dell. And uh, Dell was a startup at one time, and we still have that same passion and that same energy to help and support startups like this. Uh, last year, or actually yesterday, was our one-year anniversary for our Dell Center for Entrepreneurs, which was a $100 million investment to go out and help the entrepreneurial space. Um, so the only thing I want to encourage you guys to do is actually go to dell.com backslash entrepreneur. We have great programs there if you're a startup trying to ease access to technology. Uh, we have the Dell Founders Club, Speak, I think Distill Networks is here also, which is really trying to do anything and everything to help fuel their growth. Um, but I want to thank everyone for being here tonight and I'm going to turn it over to someone that's a lot more interesting than me. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. I am uh, I'm Vince Gray, and I'm delighted to be the mayor of the District of Columbia, but I'm even more delighted to be here at 1776. I think I'm now here about once a week. Uh, and by the way, I think Evan and Donna have done a fantastic job of launching 1776, where revolutions begin and continue. Uh, but don't they throw the best parties in the world also? I haven't been here to a party yet where there were less than uh, three or 400 people, and we obviously have been able to match that uh, again uh, tonight. Um, I, um, I'm proud that the District of Columbia is a sponsor of 1776. Uh, we, we redefined as a part of, I'm sure all of you all have read this, uh, it's a great bedtime reading, especially a great cure for uh, insomnia, uh, is our five-year economic development uh, strategy. And uh, one of the things that we said is we wanted to redefine the economy uh, here in the District of Columbia, that we have been tethered uh, since inception, I suppose, to the federal government because we are the nation's capital. But at the same time, we have a separate and distinct uh, presence. We raise $6 billion a year through our income taxes, property taxes, and sales taxes to support this city. We are a growing city. 632,000 people living in the District of Columbia at this stage. But if we ever want to have a separate and distinct uh, identity, we had to really start to redefine the economy. And what better way to do that than start to create seriously a technology presence uh, in, this, in the city? Um, Maryland and Virginia uh, have done it. In my opinion, people want to live in the District of Columbia because it is a great place to be but they'd also like to live near where they work. Uh, we have such an incredible array of professionals uh, in this city that it just made sense to be able to, uh, to move in this direction. So again, I want to thank Evan uh, Burfield and Donna Harris uh, for the work that they have done to get 1776 underway. How about a big hand for Evan and Donna? <laughs> I also want to congratulate John uh, Bracken and Danny Boyce. Uh, haven't they done a great job with uh, Speak? <laughs> I, was, I was proud to be at Distilled Intelligence uh, 2.0 uh, this year, and we were able to award them. I wish it were more, but we were able to award them $35,000, and look what they've been able to do with the resources already invested in Speak. Speak is on its way, isn't it? Yeah. Speak the truth. <laughs> um, we actually, we really are uh, at the center of innov innovation and entrepreneurship uh, here at 1776. Um, when they started, when they officially launched, which is now, what happened about a month ago that you officially launched? Um, they already had 75 startups that had been identified. How many? 103, excuse me, I'll get that right. 103, I can't even keep up with the count. 103 startups identified the day that they opened the doors to 1776. You think that we're gonna be a technology center, ladies and gentlemen? I certainly think so. In any event, um, we also are proud of what Speak has been able to do. We're very proud that we have the uh, Young Entrepreneurship Council uh, and Scott Gar Gerber uh, who are with us uh, here tonight. The Youth Entrepreneurship Council has done a fantastic job. It's unbelievable what they've accomplished. 
In 2012, Forbes, Forbes named them the uh, uh, America's most elite organization. Now, what does it mean to be America's most elite organization? I have no idea, but it really sounds good, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> what it means is that you're doing extremely well. Uh, the members uh, that they have spawned have generated billions of dollars in revenue, um, thousands of jobs, and having the YEC here in the District of Columbia is going to result in, in, in hundreds more of jobs uh, being generated uh, here in the District of Columbia. So it's a part of our major diversification uh, approach uh, here in the city, and that is bringing more technology opportunities to our city. Um, I think the day is going to come when people will say that the District of Columbia is the Silicon Valley of the East. Uh, and that means we will have really arrived, ladies and gentlemen. Can we do that? Can we do that? Can we, can we be the Silicon Valley of the East? I'm also pleased to announce uh, or to, to uh, acknowledge and uh, introduce a couple of people tonight who are going to take over uh, at this point. First of all, uh, Rick Doc Walker. Woo! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Doc he is, a, he is a storied and accomplished uh, man. He played with our Washington Redskins when they routinely won championships. <laughs> he himself was an All-American at UCLA, played nine seasons in the National Football League, most of which were with the Washington Redskins, right, right Doc? And he's now, he is now a star of TV and radio. Uh, you want to get a good commentary, good candid, frank commentary uh, on football and other sports, tune in to Rick Doc Walker because he will tell you the truth. He will speak the truth. Speak the truth. <laughs> and uh, he's also going to be joined by Danny Boss, who, Boyce, who, of course, is the co-founder uh, of Speak. Um, Danny runs uh, product and technology uh, development. Uh, he's a lifelong Washingtonian, uh, is, is invested in speak as you possibly uh, can be. Uh, he attended Harvard uh, and has done so much already. Uh, I mean, he had already, I think, spawned, uh, had already spawned and spun off a company by the time he was 25 years old. Uh, and if that's wrong, don't say, just, just take it as it is, okay? <laughs> anyway, please join me in welcoming the folks who are going to take over at this stage, Doc and Danny, D&D. &D. Yes. <laughs> so, Doc, I hear you follow high school, local high school football. Love high school football. It's... Uh, how many parents here have young men or, that are involved in high school football, or you have young ladies or cheerleaders, or you have student athletes during the band? Anybody? Okay, that means you're lifers. That means you're all in. I had no idea <laughs> how much the band, the practice, I took it for granted. We'd be out in two a day. The band is on the field as much as the players are. And the band is so significant because there's nothing better then Friday night to hear those drums going, to hear that band. And so it's all a part of it. If you have kids that are trainers, if they tape, if they're involved in any component, video, there's so much involved in the game itself, outside of the game. So I'm a huge proponent of that, and I'm commissioner of a league, Grassroots Youth Football League. We have sixth, seventh, and eighth graders participating in spring football tackle. And so I think the high school involvement from the parents is priceless to gear your kids in the right direction so that they're competitive but they're not intoxicated with the publicity part of the game. Well, so Doc, speaking of high school football, you may already know this, but I was actually the starting tight end on a certain undefeated Centerville High School freshman football team back in 93. Well, Ring a bell? No, because Don Warren was on one of those, he was a coach. That's right. Donnie coached on one of those yep. teams, and, yep. and I know I was familiar with that. It was this, I'm not mistaken, <laughs> you had the young man Royal. Was, was he might on that have, team? Might have been a little after me. A little yeah. bit, yeah. No, I'm, we I'm had, uh, Northern Virginia but, guy. Um, but seriously, I ended up going to DeMatha the next year. 
I know you're an honorary member of DeMatha. Honorary very involved. Stag. Yeah. Um, so I played sports there. I played sports my whole life. Not quite to the extent that you have. Um, but I've spent my adult life essentially building teams and building startups. And I, I see a direct correlation between team building in the corporate world, the startup world, and the team dynamics that I kind of learned and experienced on the football field, on the baseball diamond, and you know wrestling, and through my, my high school athletic career. Um, I'd be one, um, just curious about hear you talk about kind of your experience at the highest kind of echelon of athletics and the team dynamics and the great and what makes a great team. What le what are your lessons learned? What works? What doesn't? Um, how do you get teamwork to kind of work? Well, it starts with leadership. If you you had the mayor here, and you have this 1776, this platform, you got to have a platform. You have to have great leadership. If Dale being represented here, and of course, uh, the entrepreneurial spirit, you need financial backing, but you also need people that are willing to leave their ego in the glove box of the cars and come into the workplace. The biggest component I've seen is the deterrent to success in business is ego. And if you can, if you can control that, and I, I don't think you eliminate it because I think it's a positive if controlled, but everybody has to have one focus, and that is the success of the project. Not how much money you make, but the success of the project. And as a result of it, you, as you guys are prime examples of it with Speak, Dale is a world-class ex example of it. This project here and with the mayor who has a vision about the addition of technology in the District of Columbia, then he's got to support it, and everyone's got to support it. If so, then the offspring, it can be incredible. So it comes with a good vision, having goals, and then people accepting their particular roles. The Hogs, when you look down to it, it was really, it had name recognition, but it was still doing a lot of dirty work. Oh, yeah. And whether or not you're the receptionist, whether or not you park the cars, whether or not you're the custodial service, whether you're just a data, data entry person, no matter what it is, your role is significant to the long-term success of the project. And if the people in the higher levels don't appreciate you for that, then find another boss. That's exactly my philosophy. It takes good people to make great projects work. Yep. So on that note, uh, you won both the Rose Bowl and the Super Bowl as part of a team. Um, the reason we're here tonight, as John, my co-founder, mentioned, as the mayor mentioned, is we want to say thank you to our fans. Um, for a startup, fans means users, investors, supporters, community. Um, there's a lot of connections between that and, I think, the fans of a football team. Um, I'd like to hear your, your kind of your take on the impact the fans had on you winning, which is really what a startup trying to do. We're trying to win. So, what impact did the fans have on the Super Bowl win, the Rose Bowl win, your other wins in life? Well, he left out the, my most important victory, and that was high school, yeah. because I, I won in high. I won on every level, but the fans in high school are your mailman, they're the dry cleaners, they're the automotive store, they're the guy and gal at the 7-Eleven, they're community-based. So I could look up in the stands at Santa Ana Valley High School in 1973, and we beat Los Alamitos 21-7 to to win the Irvine League Championship, and I can look up in those stands, and I knew everybody there. And so four or five years later down the road, the venue changed because now it was the Rose Bowl and we're playing number one ranked Ohio State, and they're undefeated, and there's 104,000 people there. So I didn't know them all, but I knew the people, once again, that followed us as Bruins to beat the undefeated Buckeyes and 27 to 10, and to win the Rose Bowl Championship and to win the Pac-8, beating Southern Cal two weeks earlier. I remember everybody that's in that tunnel waiting on you. So these people, the fans and user-friendly, and the word of mouth. Now, I, if we had had social network, I, I just envy, I envy my kids, I envy the fact that I didn't get a chance to have social media when I was in high school and college. I would have flunked out, but it would have been so much fun <laughs> because it's so addictive, but yet we actually had to talk to people face to face, eyeball to eyeball, and we wrote letters and we, 
we had to do some things that, that, that sound so weird now. We had pay telephones. I mean, you had actually have change in your pocket because you used a pay phone. So I love the way I had to do it, the support. And then here in Washington, the greatest fans in the world were at RFK Stadium. And those stadiums used to rock. Any of you here part of that rock group that we put? Okay. So you members of that rock team we had, and it was intimidating for those that came to play us. There's nothing like having a home field advantage. We hardly ever lost at home because of our fans, and it's really one of the reasons I remain in this market because I'm from the place, Southern California, where they actually have great weather and beaches, you know, and now I'm dealing with seasonal change and coal and pollen, but the people here are well worth it. I love it. So when I look back at the last year of Speak, in my experience, I draw a lot of, con of connections to my time at DeMatha and I feel like that's when I first learned what greatness, like a great culture, felt like. Uh, you know, DeMatha, if you're not good at something, if you're not winning, it could be anything. It could be, it's academic, it could be uh, mus being a musician, it could be any sports. Uh, you just win, and it's expected, and it's embarrassing if you don't. Um, grades, you know, if, you don't, if your report card sucks, you're embarrassed the next day at school. Um, and I try to apply that to speak in building our team and building our culture. I don't, I haven't quite figured out exactly what it is that makes that culture of greatness, but I know it when I see it. Um, I'm curious to hear you talk about that secret sauce. Like, what's the difference between winning Super Bowl 16 as a Redskin or Seven, 17. 17, sorry, 17. or being a Dallas Cowboy sitting at home watching it on TV? What? What's well, the difference? Dallas, and again, in all due respect, Dallas has been to eight of them, and they've won five. So I would pick another person to tease, <laughs> like Philadelphia. But I, <laughs> but I, I'll but, take them, too. Yeah, but I'm not going to mess with Dallas until we catch them. Um, le le and we will. We no, will. We're two away. We're two away. In order for something to be special, it requires special people. In order to be friendly, you have to understand the components of friendship. You're never going to have a great company unless you have great people. You don't even need a great plan. How many re great restaurants do we know of that have average food? You don't have to have, a great, to have great food to have a great restaurant. But that restaurant has great people. You'll continue to support it. And so the first key to it is you've got to have a viable plan. Obviously, Speak does. You address something in the marketplace that was cumbersome. It was tedious. There was nothing sexy about conference calls. And you found a way to clean it up. And so that is being ahead of the, the curb. Then it's also getting the right people to execute it and, and not being afraid to fail. Most leadership falters because there's doubt. We started our campaign out here 0-5 with Joe Gibbs, who's a Hall of Famer. And we were 0-5. And, and the thing I respect so much about Joe is that we never altered our approach. We still practiced three and a half hours. We still did a lot of ridiculous things. But we continued to do them. And he wasn't yelling and cursing us out. He stuck with his plan, which we believed in, and ultimately we turned it around. Never be afraid to fail. I'm an open-door policy person. Every company has to have a, high, have a high hierarchy. But if I could, I could go in Joe's office and say, Joe, I got a problem, I got an issue, and deal with him man to man. You have to be able to express yourself if you're a part of an organization. And if they don't value your voice, I would switch them. Yeah, because your opinion is valuable, and the idea that they respect you is shown in how you value people's time. There's so many creative people that just don't have a format to express their creativity. What Speak is showing me, first of all, is jazzy. It's got a rhythm to it. You know, I was asking, what's the deal with the ape? You know, and he's saying, well, we wanted to make it simple. And, and we wanted you to understand that this was so simple and so you have something right now that, I mean, before you heard Google, first thing, first time you heard Google, what'd you think? 
stupid, right? <laughs> you know? And so this is what it's all about. We're at the age now to where you just throw it out, support it with good people, and leadership is accepting roles. And then the leaders have to compensate you. Let me repeat that. The leaders have to compensate talented people, okay? <laughs> and there's nothing, there's nothing that is more ridiculous than saying everything is even. Raul, oh my goodness, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I stand up in greatness because one of my mentors, we all have to have examples. And Raul Fernandez is an example because he has forgotten more than we may ever know about the entrepreneurship, about building a business and growing. And yet he comes out to help us tadpoles swim in the right direction. Put your hands together for an icon. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, thank you for I being here, Raul. No, that's great. See, that's, that's what it's you. about, man. There you go. There you go. So being compensated is important, but it's also having to refuse to lose mindset. I mean, I'm an addict by nature. So there's, you know, there's, there are cocaine addicts, there are alcoholics, and I'm a competition addict. And so for me, I mean, to be competitive, I'm in this thing to win it. I'm in it to see the company go to, it, to the heights, and there's absolutely nothing I won't do to make it happen. So part of winning and part of leading is just outworking people. Most people are lazy mentally by nature. And they're dependent upon you giving them something. You know, I tell my kids, it's about you going out and taking what's yours legally and taking it by your belief that you're the best person in the room. And you don't talk it, but you live it. It's no accident that I won on every level. I've lost. I've had horrible seasons. I've had, I've had that. But that is a short-term mindset for me. What I'm thinking about is the next arena the next contest, the next company, the next gig, so that I can be dominant. And I'm constantly working on that. And I'm just in the middle of it, really. I'm, not, I'm still young in that aspect, older in others. But it's all about how bad do you want it. And the average person really doesn't want it bad enough. They get a lot of lip service. They want to drive the great cars. They want a vacation in the best place in the world. But yet they'll wake up 10 minutes before they're supposed to be somewhere. They're not on time, they're late. So you gotta ask yourself, how bad do you wanna change your position in life? I mean, are you casual about it or are you aggressive about it? I'm looking for people that aggressively wanna take charge of their future. They wanna support people that have bright ideas and great concepts, and they wanna be a part of a world-class company. If you don't want Speak to be the number one company in its space in the world, and you should get the hell out of the room if I were here. Because I'm not interested I in having that. anybody that's, that's in the runner-up position. It's all about that. It's a fanatical position. And most people aren't fanatics. Most people are casual. Most people are laid back. Most people like to chill out. I don't want to do none of the above. The only thing I, tell, I would tell people if I, that I work with, the only words you can never say to me is whatever. Because whatever is the worst phrase of our, of our society. You know, because it means you don't give a damn. Whatever. I want people that can communicate in a way that is pa with passion filled. And be direct and be willing to give as much as you want to receive. And if you're that kind of person, you can help any company grow. Amen. Amen. Doc, thank you so much for being here. Um, it's been great to hear you talk. It's been great to well, hear your it. insights. Uh, it's been a great honor to interview you and share a stage with you. Um, I'm sure everyone here has gleaned invaluable insights on leadership, on greatness, on winning. Most of us here run startups or are entrepreneurial or are in some way, shape, or form can apply everything you've just talked about to what we do every day.